Hi everyone, welcome to today's student-led journal club seminar series. Uh, my name is Amory Hayes. I'm a research associate on the Joplin campus of KCU. Today, I'm going to be introducing student Dr. Payal Morari. Student Dr. Morari is a second year osteopathic medical student at Kansas City University. Student Dr. Morari is from Cerritos, California, graduated from the University of Rochester with a bachelor's in neuroscience and completed her master's in biomedical sciences at Tufts University before matriculating at KCU. She has always had an interest in holistic medicine, including non-pharmacological and non-invasive treatment modalities for chronic diseases that have such a high impact on people's daily lives. Recently, many people have shared their gut health journeys on social media, explaining how they were able to manage or reverse their gut inflammation and thus their symptoms with dietary management and lifestyle changes. This talk will highlight current research supporting food as an effective treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. So with that, student Dr. Morari, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So as Anne-Marie said, my name is student Dr. Pyle Morari, and I am presenting on um, food as treatment for inflammatory bowel diseases. The bulk of my presentation will be based on a mini review by Dr. Contreras, where she looked at multiple studies that studied how different diets impacted inflammatory bowel diseases. And I've also included a lot of background information from two of my professors. One is Dr. Schneira, who taught us the immunopathology of IBD. And then one is Dr. Seegers, who taught us the treatments for IBD. So with that, we'll get started with just a definition and prevalence of IBD. Uh, IBD is a term that encompasses two specific diseases of chronic inflammation in the GI tract. This is Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. They're named differently because they affect different portions of the GI tract and the extent to which they um, infiltrate the tissues are also different. And then we also diagnose and treat them differently. About 2.5 million people suffer from IBD in the United States with a $31.6 billion annual cost. So as Anne-Marie said, um, and as I wrote in my bio as well, part of what sparked my interest on this topic was that this has become normalized for a lot of people to just suffer with um, these gastrointestinal sy symptoms that affect their daily life. Um, and a lot of them have shared how they've been able to reverse or at least improve their symptoms through diet and lifestyle modifications. So I really wanted to understand the science behind that and then also bring it to everyone's attention so that we can not only use it to improve our patients' lives in the future, but also improve ours as we go on. So we'll go ahead and get started by uh, looking at what a healthy gut microbiome should look like. It starts with four major phyla, which are outlined on this uh, pie chart over here. So we have firmucetes, which comprise of the clostridium and lactobacillus species. And we have quite a few of other um, phyla as well, but in IBD, we have a notable decrease in clostridium species and an increase in enterobacteria species. So this distribution is really important in a healthy gut um, because as we'll see later, it's an altered distribution that kind of impacts the pathophysiology of IBD. The role of the gut microbiome is to break down things like fiber that our body doesn't have the ability to break down and absorb nutrients from. So specifically with fiber, things like starch and cellulose are things that we can't break down, but uh, bacteria are able to, sorry, <laughs> bacteria are able to break it down and produce things like acetate, butyrate, and propionate. These short chain fatty acids are then um, going to provide the primary energy source for enterocytes, which helps to create a functional epithelial barrier. They do this by acting on genes involved in creating the tight junction, and they also increase oxygen consumption in the intestinal epithelium, which stabilizes a specific transcription factor that maintains barrier integrity. So as you can see over here, something like cellulose that we can't digest is broken down by the commensal bacteria into various short chain fatty acids. Uh, these short chain fatty acids also have anti-inflammatory properties, which uh, are in a sense protective. They do this by binding the GPR43 receptor on T regulatory cells, which then release the cytokine IL-10 and inhibit inflammation or an inflammatory response um, from our innate immune system. This whole process is called uh, tolerance. And it's important because we have bacteria living in our gut that have an important role. Um, and it makes sure that our immune system doesn't attack this bacteria. So we're gonna go and look at um, the effect of diet on microbiome because um, 
at a baseline level, regardless of whether you're healthy or have inflammatory bowel disease, your diet is going to impact the bacteria that live in your gut. So what I wanted to share from this picture is just how different diets can alter the distribution of different phyla of bacteria. So we don't need to go into the specifics. I just wanted to highlight that a high protein diet, carbohydrate diets, and high fat diets are different from the high fiber diet. So now we'll take a look more at inflammatory bowel disease and the pathology that leads to this disease. So as I mentioned earlier, dysbiosis is one of the hallmarks of this disease. It basically manifests through an altered uh, distribution of the phyla that we mentioned earlier with ulcerative colitis having an increase of proteobacteria and Crohn's disease having an increase in firmicutes. And an increase in one means a decrease in other. So it just uh, kind of destroys the symbiotic balance that needs to exist in our gut. As I mentioned earlier, in IBD specifically, this manifests as a depletion in clostridium or an expansion in enterobacteria. There's also an increased permeability of the epithelial barrier, which is actually an environmental factor that is required to initiate or reactivate this disease. And finally, these microbial antigens or pathogens are able to stimulate pathogenic immune responses because they're able to get through this epithelial barrier. So specifically, um, in patients with IBD, there is data to show that uh, the epithelial barriers are compromised with especially low levels of tight junction proteins like claudin-1 and occludin. There's also an exas exacerbated epithelial infiltration of innate immune cells, such as neutrophils, macrophages, and dendritic cells, which are going to recognize the pathogens and um, initiate a immune response to it. With that, there's also an excessive activation of effector T cells, such as T helper one cells, T helper two cells, and T helper 17 cells. All of this leads to altered tolerance mechanisms. As we mentioned earlier, tolerance is really important to make sure that the healthy bacteria can continue doing their job and that we don't have an anti or in, an inflammatory response. Um, but in an altered tolerance setting, our Fox P3 positive T regulatory cells are unable to be activated because they require clostridium species for activation, which is decreased in patients with IBD. So now we'll go into current pharmacological treatments that target IBD, and most of them do so by dampening inflammation, either by preventing inflammatory cells from reaching the site of inflammation, which is done by 5-acetyl salicylic acid inhibitors, TNF-alpha inhibitors, or alpha-4 inhibitors, or by preventing the maturation of inflammatory cells, which is done by IL-12 and IL-23 inhibitors and Janus kinase inhibitors. The issue with these drugs is because they are targeting, targeting the entire immune system, they have a lot of adverse uh, effects such as GI related or central nervous system related issues. There's also a risk for liver toxicity and a risk for in, uh, serious infections since we're dampening the entire immune system. We also have a risk for major adverse cardiac events and thrombosis, which could lead to deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. And there's also a rare but still increased risk of various malignancies. There's also very low success rate with up to about a third of patients failing primary therapy. And of those who respond to primary therapy, 60% uh, of them uh, lose response over time. So ultimately, the remission rates of these drugs are less than 50%, which means that current medications are unable to prevent recurrent flare-ups. So with the current uh, drugs that we have, with they have such a widespread effect on the immune system, we want them to at least work if they are going to be able to, even if they are going to initiate all these adverse responses, but a lot of the data is showing that they uh, aren't able to work long-term. So now we'll go more into the effect of diet on the epithelial barrier in the setting of a healthy gut and in a colitis gut. A lot of these studies were done on mouse models. So in a high fat, low fiber diet, um, researchers noticed that there was increased mucosal permeability and reduced growth of the mucosal layer. They also noticed, however, that with transplantation of the microbiome, there was complete restoration of mucosal permeability and uh, restored growth of the mucosal layer. So this really showed the impact that a healthy microbiome can have on not only improving the gut's um, state, but also reversing the disease state. In a high fat diet, they noticed an abnormal epithelial layer with um, shallower crypts and, and shorter villi which led to less differentiated intestinal cells. They also noticed increased barrier permeability and decreased expression of tight junction proteins like claudin and occludin, which as we mentioned earlier, is something that happens in patients with IBD as well. 
In a low fiber diet, they noticed that there was mucosal epithelial erosion done by bacteria um, that basically ate away at the mucosa of the GI tract. Another key component of this was dietary emulsifiers. For anyone who doesn't know what these are, they are basically uh, an emulsifier is able to combine um, different components of processed foods, and they're found in multiple different processed foods. If you are somebody who's used to reading the label on your foods, um, I'm sure most of these will sound familiar to you. They also promote mucosal erosion and they induce the expression of bacterial virulence genes to trigger chronic inflammation. So a lot of those tests studied just the effects of those diets on um, a healthy gut, but now the researchers wanted to understand how diet interacted with a gut that also was suffering from inflammatory bowel disease. So they induced inflammatory bowel disease by using a polysaccharide known as dextran sodium sulfate. It induces experimental acute and chronic colitis in mouse models. So in a high fat diet, or in, in mice that were fed a high fat diet, they took the offspring of those mice and um, implemented DSS and noted that there was more severe colitis in the offspring that also were treated with DSS rather than uh, just the mice that had only DSS. In another study, they noticed that high protein, they compared the high protein diet with DSS compared to a high fiber diet with DSS. And here they looked at the specific protein casein, which is found in a lot of dairy products. And they noticed that it changed the gut microbiota, microbiota in a way that um, was directly proportional to the severity of colitis and reduced survival in mice. With the high fiber diet, however, there was increased survival by at least 15 days and reduced colitis and reduced um, epithelial permeability. So even though 15 days might seem like a very short time in a mouse's life, um, I think it's really important to highlight that something like a diet was able to increase survival by such like at baseline, it was able to increase survival against um, a drug that has been known to induce colitis. So now we'll look into how these uh, therapies can be applied to human models. So plant-based and fiber-rich foods have been shown to increase short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria in humans. And there's also been shown, multi-fiber mix, which is a supplementation, has also been shown to expand and activate mucosal CD4 positive FOXP3 T regulatory cells. There's also been reduced to disease pathology, restored barrier function, and butyrate, which is one of the main short-chain fatty acids, um, actually has a direct role on increasing macrophage differentiation, which increases um, the resistance to enteropathogens. So this is important because it shows that fiber and having a healthy gut composition not only uh, reduces anti or produces anti-inflammatory effects, but it also produces protective um, inflammatory responses by having macrophages that are ready to combat the bacteria that shouldn't be there while also protecting the bacteria that should be there. Next, we'll move on to dietary treatments for IBD in the human trials. So the study looked at, or the review looked at six different studies or six different diets that lasted from four to 12 weeks. These included the exclusive enteral nutrition diet, which is a liquid diet that allows the gut to rest and it's often prescribed to patients with Crohn's disease. There was the specific carbohydrate diet, which is a nutritionally complete green-free diet that's low in sugar and lactose. There was the whole foods diet that is a minimally processed, that comprises of minimally processed foods with an emphasis on plants and less animal products. There was the Mediterranean diet, which is similar to the whole foods diet. It's plant-based with an emphasis on whole grains, fruits, vegetables, uh, beans, and legumes and nuts. There's the low FODMAP diet, which is a global restriction of all fermentable carbohydrates, and FODMAP just stands for all the fermentable carbohydrates. And then IBD anti-inflammatory di diet emphasized soluble fiber. So here we can look at the different outcomes for each of these diets. In the exclusive enteral nutrition diet, there was a remission in 79% of patients with an additional mucosal healing. In the specific carbohydrate diet, all symptoms were resolved when, within three months, um, and there was remission noted in 100% of patients. Along with the whole foods diet, there was also remission in 100% of patients. In the Mediterranean diet, there was symptomatic remission in 44% of patients after six weeks and in 40% of patients after 12 weeks. 
In the low FODMAP diet, there was reduced disease activity and higher health-related quality of life scores with reduced symptoms in 50% of patients. In the IBD anti-inflammatory diet, there was disease activity um, decreased significantly in all patients, and all patients were able to discontinue at least one of their prior IBD medications. And in that last trial, they were also able to introduce probiotics, um, which helped to promote the growth of healthy bacteria in their gut lumen. So I wanted to also note that although these numbers do seem very high, um, the trials for these often included between, I would say, 10 to 60 patients. Um, so I did want to keep that in mind, but I still think that these numbers are very remarkable, um, given that this is a chronic disease that is all, often very overwhelming. And when a lot of our known treatments have a lot of um, adverse side effects, I think something like this could be very powerful if we introduce it earlier on. The paper also touched on future implications. Specifically, Dr. Contreras uh, cited the South Asian IBD Alliance, um, and they promote the need for culturally competent, evidence-based, patient-centric care via advocacy, education, and training to improve IBD outcomes in South Asian patients across the globe. She also noted that culturally sensitive interventions have been implemented with success in beha behavioral health trials, including in trials that promoted healthy eating. So why not apply it to IBD treatments um, that could help patients suffering from this chronic disease? Finally, these last few slides are more uh, a bit more informal because they're a lot more about what sparked my interest in this topic and why I think that gut health is, is so important. So uh, one of the major, I guess, factors or conversations around gut health is the impact that it has on mental health. Um, a lot of our neurotransmitters are actually made in our intestine. So with an in or impaired intestinal barrier or intestinal dysbiosis, we'll have altered, um, altered production of those neurotransmitters, which will then affect our brain and can cause symptoms like depression, anxiety. It could also cause other, other pain symptoms like abdominal pain. And it all ties in together essentially. So some of these, some of these neurotransmitters are glutamate, GABA, serotonin, and dopamine. And student Dr. Luigi Loizzo is actually going to be presenting on this topic in a couple of weeks. So if you're interested, you should tune into his talk. Um, I also think that this is important for us to incorporate into our future work as physicians. Earlier, I touched on a lot of the drugs that are used to treat IBD. The current um, treatment regimen per Mayo Clinic is to include anti-inflammatory drugs, immune suppressants, and biologics, which all dampen the immune system, antibiotics, which attempt to kill the bacteria before they can cross the impaired uh, epithelial barrier, anti-diarrheal medications, and pain relievers, which attempt to relieve the symptoms, and then vitamin supplements and other forms of nutritional support, which um, aim to make up for the fact that our, our gut is unable to um, absorb necessary nutrients. And then lastly, there's surgery, which often requires resecting a portion of a bowel. Lastly, I think that preventing or preventative counseling can be really powerful in empowering our patients. In second year, we've already started doing this uh, with motivational interviewing for metabolic diseases, such as diabetes, mellitus, and uh, hypertension. But I think using it in a case like chronic um, inflammatory disease or in IBD uh, could be very powerful because I think um, IBD is something that is very scary and patients are diagnosed with it. And it often feels, like I said, overwhelming and they don't know how they can eradicate a disease that has progressed so far. But with changing one's diet, even if it doesn't eradicate the disease completely, if it can improve their quality of life and their symptoms, it kind of restores some of the power to the patient. Uh, and I think that we could do a lot for our patients' um, mental health and physical health just by encouraging this and making it known to them that the diet actually does have a very powerful impact on their gut. Things that we can do um, as healthcare providers or just even students right now in healthcare, I think um, there are a lot of ways that we can practice healthier gut health habits as well. This could be like mindful eating practices, um, trying to incorporate more whole foods. <laughs> a lot of us drink coffee or other forms of caffeine um, and incorporating that into our diets after eating food could also help because coffee is very acidic and it um, often can lead to ulcers or any kind of any, any other kind of destructive um, mechanism on our gut. Drinking enough water is also very important for our gut motility. Movement, uh, there's been a lot of research on how movement 
or exercise in general promotes mental health. And this all goes back to the gut brain axis and how our mental health and our gut health are tied together. And then this is just something that I'm passionate about. I think eating seasonally is not only fun and like a, a better, like a fun way to incorporate mindful eating, but it also um, allows us to explore different nutrients and to explore different ways of incorporating uh, a lot of whole foods into our diets. Further practices that um, people could use. So Sadhguru right now is um, a person who's, he, he's studied yoga and Ayurveda for a long time. And he's somebody who knows how to, I guess, translate it to our generation. Uh, and one of the things that he likes to say is that yoga is a technology. So even though often yoga is misrepresented as a Hindu practice or something that is very uh, religious, he's kind of uh, eradicated all of that and said that it's simply a way for us to bring um, different parts of our bodies together. So I like this quote because it really reminded me of one of our tenets of osteopathic medicine. And his quote is, your mind is thinking and feeling one way, your physical body is going another way and your energy another way. Yoga is simply the science of aligning these three dimensions. I also wanted to highlight that there are, only, uh, there are about 196 short verses that define yoga. And only one of these is the physical asanas that a lot of people now understand to be yoga. So I just think that I, this is something that I'm still learning about, but I think yoga has um, a very powerful, I guess like there's, there's a lot of um, impact that it could have given that we only understand such a small bit of it, or at least I know that I only understand a small bit of it. That being said, there are physical asanas that can be done um, specifically to promote gut motility and to promote like a, gut, a healthier gut, whether that involves um, the parasympathetic parasympathetic nervous system, or actually just like guess, uh, activating the muscles of the gut. Finally, this is just an image from the NIH that showed in 2010, um, 13 million adults were using yoga as a complementary health approach. Um, and then finally, this is just a YouTube channel. His name is FitTuber. And uh, he has a lot of uh, playlists. And I think the reason I wanted to incorporate this was just in case anyone else is interested in taking up yoga or just learning more about gut health and um, non-pharmacological ways that you can kind of promote gut health in, through your daily practices. I think he does a very good job of breaking things down um, in a very digestible way. <laughs> okay, that's it. So these are my uh, papers that I referred to. And then I also included some of the lectures that I referenced. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, student Dr. Murari. Great presentation. Um, I really liked all of your visuals. They really helped me digest all the information. So um, thank you for presenting. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Feel free to uh, raise your hand in Zoom, or if you can't talk, you can also type it in the chat and I can read it out. Uh, Dr. Joy. So my absolute apologies, but um, my my brother called in the middle of this, um, so I'm I'm disappointed I didn't get to see um, more of it. Um, but one of the things I want to say is there was a, a study on mice um, where they actually did like a ligature at the um, uh, cisterna chile, um, and what they found was that the the mice that were that had the ligature placed developed irritable bowel or not sorry irritable inflammatory bowel like symptoms or syndromes. Um, so I, I love the fact that like increasing body movement and increasing yoga um, can um, can increase that lymphatic flow, can increase that health. Um, that is maybe the the basis of some of this issue. So um, I like that the idea like, you know, increasing fiber is is increasing motility, but it's also doing lots of cool things on that um, cellular level. So I just want to say I appreciate your talk and sorry, I missed the middle. I'll have to go back and look, watch it. Oh, no, thank you. That I'm glad you shared that. That's really exciting. Um, I think is it Ivan has a question. Uh, yes, um, Ivan is here, but I'm his girlfriend. I'm also a student at Joplin and then on his cell phone. Um, this is Zenobia. I'm a first year. Um, I was just curious, uh, the patients that went on the different diets to essentially resolve all the symptoms and they went into 100% remission and even the diets where they didn't go right away, but eventually they did. Uh, was there any follow-up on whether those patients resumed their 
previous diet because that's part of the reason that's part of the issue with diets is people don't want to stick to them they and I, I really think eating healthy is a lifestyle choice for the rest of your life but people don't want to do that so was there any follow-up on whether or not the symptoms returned once they returned to their other diet or did just changing their diet for a short amount of time fix their gut so much that it was sustained throughout you know months and years afterwards yeah, I actually didn't look into each of the individual papers that looked at them. The systematic review just looked from the duration of the intervention. And a lot of them treated either like midway through or at the end of the intervention. So a lot of those remission rates are just during the intervention. But I would imagine that it would be something that they would need to continue. Um, even if it promotes some healing, I don't think that it would eradicate it completely and allow them to like go back. Because the whole the whole point of this was that um, your gut microbiota is so dependent on your diet. So I, I would think that it's something that needs to be continuous. I, I would assume so as well. I was just I was curious. I wish people would yeah. stick to a good diet for their whole lives. I know. They usually don't, which is and I, I know, exactly. And I think that's why um, the, the doctor who wrote this wanted to really push for culturally competent measures because that's one of the things that's really hard for people to stick to a diet that doesn't um, take into account like the foods that they are used to eating or like the spices that they're used to incorporating. So if there's a way for us to prescribe diets that are more um, conscious of those, I think it would have a better chance of allowing patients to stick to them long term. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, keep raising your hand. You do have one in the chat. I'm going to read out really quick. Um, this is from student Dr. Bala, uh, who's actually our presenter in two weeks. Uh, they're going to be our NERV presenter. So thanks for being here. Uh, their question is, was there any data available on solid versus liquid diets on IBD symptomatic improvement? Or what are your thoughts? I did not come across that in my paper <laughs> or in my research. Um, but I do remember for the patients who are on the EEN diet, which is the purely liquid diet, I think there wasn't as much mucosal healing as there was for the whole food diet. Um, or, or there was mucosal healing, but there wasn't enough of a restoration of the healthy bacteria. So I think the liquid diet is meant to be a short-term application that allows the gut to just like rest and reset. But I think in terms of long-term practices, uh, solid foods are definitely probably necessary to introduce that fiber that feeds the healthy bacteria. Um, Dr. Joy, do you have another question? I, I was thinking about diet. I, I had a patient who had um, ulcerative colitis in my practice, and um, I was seeing her for OMT. Um, she got significantly better actually with uh, um, acupuncture um, and did, was doing great. She had changed her diet. She was doing great. And I actually saw her twice a year after she got everything kind of stabilized. Um, she would go to uh, a brunch, and whenever she ate bacon, she would have a big flare and then her back would start to hurt and then she'd come see me. So in the green scheme of things, you know, as diet is a huge, huge, great factor, um, but we all fall off the wagon a bit here and there. So there you go. Any other questions, comments? Hi, I had one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if uh, any of the diets that included uh, any sort of probiotics in them uh, have been separately looked at. I know the literature on probiotics is mixed right now, but I haven't looked at it in a while. I was just wondering uh, what the thoughts were on that for treating things like IBD and Crohn's. Yeah, so in this one, let me go back to the slide. Um, the last, this one, the um, IBD anti-inflammatory diet is the one where they introduced probiotics into the diet as well. And they notice that along with all of these, um, you know, excellent things that happened, it also promoted uh, more clostridium species, which is what is decreased in the setting of IBD. That's all oh. I know about the topic. <laughs> oh, okay. And did you did you recall like what kind of probiotic foods? Exactly? No, they just said they just said probiotics. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stottinger, you have a question? I don't. Um, while you were giving your presentation, I was cooking salmon, smoked salmon on a cedar plank. Can you guys see that? With yeah. cabbage and corn. 
<laughs> and just, I just thought I would show you that and ask, <laughs> is that a great diet or what? <laughs> I think so. You have you have all your you know major components. You have some fiber in there. Yeah, the boiled cabbage, yeah, uh, corn, and smoked salmon. I'm gonna go eat it. <laughs> Sounds yummy. Um, any other questions, comments? Um, if not, thank you so much again to Dr. Marari. Thank you so much for having me, guys. And thanks for everyone who tuned in.